Welcome to Disrupting Japan, straight talk from Japan's most successful entrepreneurs. I'm Tim Romero, and thanks for coming out tonight. You guys are awesome. All right, to our listeners at home or wherever you might be in podcast land, we've got a special show for you tonight. We are broadcasting live from Super Deluxe and Roppongi with the most creative and dynamic group of people in the world, which is Tokyo's startup community. All right, and we've got an astounding panel discussion for you. And before we get to that and our kampai, I've got to call out three members of the startup community who really helped put this event together. There's absolutely no way I could have done it without them. There are startups themselves, and you should know a bit about them. So uh, first is Justa.io, and I think Ellen is here from Justa. Where are you, Elena? There's Elena. Everyone wave at Elena. So Justa is Japan's really best start startup job board. If you're an engineer or a programmer looking to work at a startup, or if you're a startup looking to hire engineers or programmers, you want to talk to Elena. Uh, second, I want to introduce Crew with two Ws. And what Crew with two Ws does is they run open innovation programs for Toyota and Panasonic and JTB. And these big companies really want to work with startups, but they're bad at it. <laughs> So that's where Crew comes in to help out. They also have something, they also have a startup kit, which is a bundle of goodies from IBM and um, uh, Microsoft and a bunch of big companies that they give away for free to startup. And Kozue is around here from Crew. Kozue, where is Kozue? Way in the back, <laughs> over there. Now, Kozue will pretend she doesn't speak English, but her English is really, really good. So don't be shy. And last, and certainly not least, is Digital Hub. Uh, you will see these guys running around with cameras and microphones documenting this event for all posterity. Uh, and you want to talk to Steve, who is over there. So these guys also do great commercial work. Uh, you can see it on the website, or you can see it right now. They're going to be producing this. You might be watching this on YouTube right now, and they do amazing work, don't they? <laughs> All right, so without further ado, two, three, ah. is that yours? We seem to be one bottle short. No, no, we got, no. We got, okay? we got Oh, James got, got two of them, bottle. did he? All right. <laughs> oh, no, never mind. All right. Um, じゃあ、おかげさまで2周年記念日迎えとできた、迎えたことできました。まあ、これからも引き続きよろしくお願いします。乾杯。And now we will go back into English. And I'm going to break with convention here. And I'm going to make the introductions because I know you guys. And I know if I hand you a microphone and tell you to talk about yourselves and your portfolio, I would not get that microphone back for a good 30 minutes. So uh, on the far left, we have Hiro Maida who is currently the head of BeNext. And before that, he started uh, Binos's incubation and acceleration program. Before that, he started one of the very first and still one of the most successful accelerators in Japan, Digital Garage's uh, OnLab. And in the center, uh, James Reine, who's Japan head for 500 startups. And before that, you put in some time at uh, DNA as well. And rounding out our group <coughs> is Shinji Asada, who is now head of Salesforce Ventures Japan. And before that, you were working at Itochu Techno Ventures, and quite frankly, probably has more years of investing and VC experience than the rest of us up here on stage combined. So. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah you can, you can, well, you can take that either way you like. I, I meant it as a compliment. So um, let's get started. So uh, the first question I got for you guys. Uh, now this is, Hiro, especially for you, but all of you, I think in the last few years there's been a tremendous interest in investment in Southeast Asia. There's been uh, a lot of funds both from the U.S. that have focused not so much on Japan but on China and Asia, and even a lot of Japan funds that have been seemingly more interested in what's going on in Southeast Asia rather than what's happening in Japan. And so I'm wondering, what's behind this? Is there, why is this happening? Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, so 70, I think 60% of our fund is allocated outside of Japan, actually, uh, primarily India and Southeast Asia. And the reason why is, uh, is mainly because of China. Um, over the last decade, you see, you see China's GDP grow 4x, and its rankings go, what, they run from like fifth to second, surpassing Japan. And, and what's happened is a lot of the Japanese invest investors, including our ourselves, uh, see that and like what the hell just happened and why are we not part of that party, right? And um, and so uh, when you when you think about where's the next China, you know what's going, where can we find the next China? Uh, you look at basically the companies with, with really high GDP growth and which is currently India, uh, Southeast Asia primarily, um, uh, J Jakarta or Indonesia, right? And that's the reason why a lot of investors, including ourselves, are looking outside of Japan to invest. So is it? Do you think it's mostly? Um it makes sense on the fundamental level, or is this kind of a herd behavior? It's uh, more like fear of missing out. So, yeah. I mean, like, it sucks that we weren't part of Alibaba, right? <laughs> and so... Uh, kind, kind of. I mean, Japan was, right? SoftBank. Yeah, yeah. I guess. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, SoftBank was part of Alibaba. That was the only, like, Japanese entity that was part of it, right? And so... Yeah, we're looking for the next Alibaba. Okay. Well, James, your, so, your portfolio is only Japan. Are you worried well, about well, missing well, out? Well, actually, uh, at DNA, I was doing investments in Southeast Asia, so I am familiar with Southeast Asia, and our Southeast Asia fund has been doing quite well. Uh, so uh, I think Southeast Asia is obviously a really important market to be in. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think, at least from the Japan side, uh, part of it is that Japanese just like to be in Southeast Asia. I think there's definitely a little bit of like kanko kibun. They just want to travel. Yeah, I, it's, I fun mean, to, it's fun seriously. to party there, yeah. It's right. And, and, but that's actually important. You know, it, I think Southeast Asia has a lot of soft power for VCs in Japan. Um, however, you don't really see US money in Southeast Asia. And so the only exception is Sequoia. And even Sequoia invests from their India fund, right? So it's not really US money, right? So, so do you think we're going to see that, that kind of growth? Do you think Japan has the growth potential? that Hiro was talking about for Southeast Asia? Well, listen, Southeast Asia is a, an emerging market. So comparing like uh, the macro uh, uh, side, obviously there's going to be more growth in Southeast Asia, right? Japan is just a developed market. Um, but there are also going to be other opportunities in Japan where uh, that aren't going to come up in Southeast Asia, right? Um, more on the technology side, for example, because you have much higher education levels, you have the infrastructure in place, things like that. So yes, maybe you'll see something similar to what, you s what you've seen in China, but I think there's sort of this uh, akogare, like this this thinking, like I mean, as you mentioned, probably FOMO, yeah. infatuation with uh, with Southeast Asia. But I mean, Southeast Asia is a very fragmented market. Uh, in particular, when we're talking about Southeast Asia, maybe it's Indonesia, actually, right? Yeah. So fourth, fourth largest uh, country in the world in terms of population. So uh, obviously there's going to be a lot of uh, similarities between um, you know, that growth that you saw in China, and then now we're seeing something similar in India. Probably the next one's going to be Indonesia as well. And, and that's probably getting faster and faster and faster because there's so much FOMO, as you mentioned, on each stage, right? Okay. We're very fear-driven animals. Right. Yeah, exactly. VCs are very emotional, right? The, the best thing you can tell a VC is, oh, yeah, we're not fundraising. No, we, d we don't need money. Yeah, yeah. We're like, no, no, take, take our money. <laughs> so the spreadsheets are all just a front. It's all a facade. Exactly. <laughs> you know, look, looking at your question about Southeast Asia, I, just, I did some quick research, but, you know, the facts are actually wrong, actually. So 2014-15, the majority of investments of the, the VC money was pumped into Japanese startups. And for 2016, Q2, if you look at research that's uh, done by v, uh, VEC, 67% of the money was in, you know, invested into Japanese startups. So 
the hype sort of looks like Southeast Asia looks like the you know chunk of the money going in. But actually, if you look at the data, which we love at Salesforce Ventures, <laughs> 67 percent of the money was actually deployed into Japanese startups. And if you also look at 2015, you know uh, amounts of money raised by funds like you know these two gentlemen, uh, it was about two billion, which was two x the previous year. So there's going to be a lot more money coming into the Japanese startup. So if any of you guys are trying to start startups in Japan, there's going to be a lot of money out there. Okay. I, I think we've got a few people starting startups out here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but uh, actually, let me, let I, I'm, I'm really happy to hear data. that data, actually, because I, I felt the same yeah. thing when we were fundraising. It was like we were competing with like 15 other funds. It was like, God damn it. Like, <laughs> but there's well, so much undeployed capital let me, now. Let me dig into that, because I honestly, I was also under the impression that there was more money flowing into Southeast Asia and Japan. Is it just... Um, are there later stage deals in Japan? Are the individual deals bigger? Is that what's happening? So, I mean, if you look at like the whole capital amount that's being raised in Southeast Asia, maybe the comparison might be on your end mm -hmm. that there's much more capital there. But I'm talking about like Japanese institutional money going outside Southeast Asia w versus into Japan startups. Oh, I see. I so, see. So, so, so that's the difference here. So the Japanese are still overwhelmingly investing in Japan. Yes, and if you look at recent rounds, like you know. Uh, Life is tech. Uh, I just saw an article about uh, uh, which uh, the fintech company. Yeah, you know it's close to like ten million dollars of funding, right? So there's a lot of capital that's ready to be deployed towards maybe one of your companies. So okay, I'm and that trend is accelerating. Right. right. I'm not trying to like you know persuade you guys to start companies or anything. I'm just I, I am. I am. I am. I am. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> I am. I mean, right. The, but, the other three of us are. Right. But that, that's the data. So right. I'm just okay. want to be clear on that. Excellent. Um, let me also ask you, one of the things I've been most impressed with on Japanese startups, so the first, I started my first company, wow, almost 20 years ago here. And over the last 20 years, over the last five years, the sophistication of the average Japanese startup founder has grown by leaps and bounds. Uh, I, I think it's, the internet has a lot to do with that. People are looking for best practices. They're looking around the world to see what, what works. And so the founders have learned and they've gotten better. I can't quite say the same things for Japanese VCs. But now that's, you know, that's, oh, that's shots oh. fired, shots fired. You know, that's, that's me. I'm sitting on the other side of the table here. Okay. Um, Maybe you had a tough fundraising appearance. I've had a couple. Uh, yeah. I've, uh, Bitter entrepreneur. <laughs> I've had a couple. If yeah. we invested, you would um, think otherwise. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd keep it to myself. Um, but no, what do you guys think about that? Do you think there is a, a gap in the behavior or the, the outlook between Japanese investors and uh, foreign investors or between, say, uh, Japanese institutional investors versus this kind of newer, more flexible funds? Right. Is there really a gap? Um, definitely. I mean... <laughs> In conclusion, I mean, the U.S. VC scene is much more competitive. They're trying to be the lead investor in the Series A round, right? Whereas in Japan, if you're raising a Series A, you'll have syndicates. You'll have three or four or maybe like f six or seven VCs investing in the Series A round. So naturally, it's, it's a collaborative environment in Japan. And why is that? Because we're 170th the size of the U.S. market in terms of the VC market. So if the companies are raising more money in Japan, they're trying to raise five or seven million they have to talk to five or six or seven VCs. So the nature fundamentally is totally different. So that, that's one. So there, there's no real competition among the VCs for the larger deals? I mean, there is competition in a way, but not as fierce as in the US is what All I'm right. trying to say. Okay. So uh, I actually think the sophistication of the market has gotten much, much better. <laughs> now, <laughs> caveat on the VC <laughs> side too, yeah. Um, so there are there are a lot of smart VCs in Japan, and they've gotten smarter. Uh, some examples are like Globus or or these fine-looking gentlemen here, <laughs> or uh, or Will World Innovation Lab. So there are VCs that you know we make a conscious effort to you know throw deals. That once the companies become uh, a certain size, we want these particular VCs to to invest money in them. Um, however, on the because the nature of the Japanese market is that most of it is corporate venture capital. Uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of salaryman VCs, and uh, so if you look at percentage of unsophisticated VCs, it's increasing. But 
that's not because they, the percent there that's not because the number of smart VCs is declining it's because the other way around there's just unsophisticated VCs coming into the market okay Kiro? um I, I highly resonate with both of them um, it's mainly I mean yeah I, I agree with uh, Shinji basically it's competition right and um, competitiveness basically makes VCs look for ways to differentiate themselves, looks for ways to basically uh, add more value. I mean, if you look at you know what, what what makes a good VC, it's basically they're good pickers and they add value in some way in, in either HR or product or strategy or partnership. Um, and to be honest, uh, in the U.S., it's it's much more competitive that everyone's trying to basically increase those kind of values. And it's also it also helps them marketing wise, right? When they want to market to entrepreneurs, they can, they say we have a staff of 100 people who can help you with partnerships. Um, but doesn't work that way in Japan because competitive there's not so much competition. Yeah. Do you think this is going to change? Because I mean, as Shinji mentioned, there's a lot more money coming to the market. Um, the money seems to be accelerating faster than quality startups. So do you think we're going to see that kind of competition, or do you think it's going to stay a very sort of Japanese-style collaborative and consultative landscape? I mean, the model is if you have more, you know, uh, so it's a demand and supply thing, right? So if you have, like, one unicorn out there, which is literally Merikari, uh, you have money hunting them down about adding value, so, uh, you know, the model's gonna work that way, but if there's only one Mercari out there, and like, you know, 9,000 companies, that's, 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 I can't say sh shit here, but probably sure shit. Can. Sure you can, sure Knock yourself out, we'll bleep you <laughs> if it gets out of control. Exactly, exactly. So, but if, if that's the case, the model's not gonna work and just gonna stay as is, but it's, it's, I hope it's, it's gonna, you know, change. I, I, I think the bar is gonna get higher and higher for, for what the quality, what the expected quality is for VCs. Um, I mean, uh, obviously, may, maybe, I mean, James is right, maybe the majority might be not on, might, might not be, might not be on par, but I think there's going to be a minority of investors or professional investors who b keeps on raising the bar, right? And I think the bar will keep on going higher, yeah. Right, so it, there's also a question among VCs, are you competing on brand? Are you competing on value add? Are you competing on valuation? You know, they, there's all sorts of things that we compete on, right? And the worst thing is to have to compete on valuation. That's the fucking <laughs> worst, right? So, like, we've had situations where no one wanted to invest in this company, and then we said, okay, we'll give you a term sheet. And immediately, of course, they shot the deal, right? I don't blame them. Uh, and then, you know, they get, like, a you know, valuation double what we, we offered. Fortunately, at the end of the day, they still chose us, but that still scared us a bit because there's, you know, some salaryman VC saying, yeah, yeah, you know, I don't get any carry anyway, so it doesn't matter. I just want to win the deal for uh, Shinerji, you know? Right. <laughs> well, Shinji, do you think that is, do, do Japanese VCs, because you've worked with a lot of institutional investors, mm -hmm. do they view themselves as competing with other VCs? Not really. Okay. Right. So there is, well, Recently with, um, so Shinji and James, you both work for foreign VCs. Right. And do you think the amount of foreign capital coming into the market, foreign VCs coming to the market, or um, Japanese money being managed by foreign companies, do you think that's going to change the landscape? Yeah, I think, you know, James and I are trying to, you know, change that, right? Like being in the game and showing out into the US world that there is an opportunity to invest in Japanese startups. So I'm trying to you know, cultivate that. So yeah, I but I think I actually br bringing in, if you're taking institutional money from, from like, let's say the U US, who is highly so sophisticated about investing in venture capital funds, um, uh, I, I think it's inevitable that the, the guy who's running the, the fund would basically try to match that quality or at least the returns, right? And so. Um, yeah, I think if you take foreign money or especially U.S. Institu institutional money, then you would try to aim higher in, in terms of returns or the quality you right. offer to yours. Because remember, they're yeah. comparing returns to Silicon Valley, which are like um, yeah. unseen yeah, yeah. altitude. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Well, yeah, and, and but the foreign firms definitely view themselves as competing with other VCs. That's the whole, I mean, that's a big part of the mindset there. So, so uh, first of all, I don't want to make it like foreign VCs versus domestic VCs. Like, no, no, I, I just meant to, I, I meant an approach the to the market, whether it's we're all in this together or you know we're trying to maximize return for our investors. 
it, it's a different mindset you bring to the table. And, and if that uh, maximizing returns for investors and actually viewing it as a competition, in the end, increases returns, it would seem that would kind of force a change among the Japanese VCs as well. Although, I don't know, are, are Japanese VCs <coughs> that return sensitive, or are they really after the, the synergy? Well, it's really hard to say, because, okay, so uh, in Silicon Valley, um, most venture capital comes from uh, institutional investors, like endowments, pension funds, insurance companies, et cetera. Uh, in Japan, that's not the case. Most of them, not only are VC, most VCs corporate venture capital, but most of us VCs raise money from corporates. And so uh, we, ca we categorize returns into financial return, uh, strategic return, and then we also have this thing called branding return. Um, and the, the latter two are you know, not related to financial. It's like synergy or like we want to show the market that we're you know, very startup friendly, you know, this kind okay. of stuff. Hmm. Um, and because of that, uh, VCs might not be as concentrated on, on the financial return part. Right? But we think that you think that's going to be changing moving forward, yeah? Well, particularly like independent VCs, we kind of have to because if we don't deliver returns, obviously <laughs> we're going to have trouble raising money. Right? The next so, round becomes difficult. Right, yeah. right. <clears throat> okay, let me ask you, instead of big market questions, kind of specific questions about how, how you manage your own funds. And, and in fact, the, the, the number one question I got to ask you is, and I hate this question, and I'm not going to ask this question, but the, the question was well, You like, are asking. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to preempt it. I'm just letting you know what question I am not asking, which is, um, you know, what are you interested in investing in? What kind of companies are you investing in? And, th and the reason that's a horrible question. I actually love that question. It, yeah, I know. It's easy. <laughs> but the problem is the answer changes from season to season and from fund to fund, and there's no really meaningful answer. So I'm going to ask you something that's much harder instead. Okay. I'm going to ask you about what I call green lights and red flags. So a, gr a red flag would be something that, what, what is a red flag, like a, a signal that when everything else in the deal looks good, and it would something you would normally be very excited to invest in, but if there's one behavior of a founder or one aspect of the team that just makes you feel like it's not right and you would pass, and a green light would be the opposite of that. It would be something where a deal you would normally pass on, but there would be something about the founder or something about it that you'd say, okay, I'll, I'll take a second look. This, this deserves more attention. So let, let's start with uh, red flags. Anyone so, else? Yeah, red flag. Uh, so I wrote an article for TechCrunch uh, Japan about this, but uh, it's integrity. Um, <clears throat> and it's integrity slash incompetence. Uh, Incompetence would not. No, oh, oh, well, sorry, sorry, I, I say that because uh, you know, not to point fingers, but it, you know, we had a situation where we really, really loved the founder, we loved the business, we loved everything about it, uh, and then we dove into the numbers. We're like, okay, these are the terms. Okay, we're good. Okay, now let's dive in. Let's you know check whether everything in the deck, uh, everything that was stated, was as actually true. And when we looked at the contracts, it was like most of them had been expired. Uh, and so like it was like significantly different retention the uh, MRR the monthly recurring revenue was completely different and like all, all sorts of things like that So and he says he blames it on the sales team Okay, he uh. says like oh the sales team everybody. but like okay whether it's integrity a uh, problem with integrity or if it's a problem with Incompetence it doesn't matter. That's a deal-breaker, right? And, and in that case if he'd given you the the true numbers true numbers We would have reconsidered it. Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe the valuation would be lower because it would have to be market rate But still we'd reconsider it. Yeah, okay but That completely deal broke it Here? Um, Yeah, I think I'll, I'll say my red light and green light at the same time sure, but it's basically progress, right? So you, you meet an entrepreneur usually like over the course of you, you meet the you know entrepreneur maybe two or three times over the course of maybe one week to a month and you know if the second time you meet them and the third time you meet them if you see progress like in any way like they're they're the way they're, they're the way they think is more clear they have better strategy or their metrics are increasing or you know the conversions are increasing if, if if anything is going up and to the right then it's a really really positive sign right um and we love that um and and if if you're standing still after a month and not making any progress and you know, uh, you know, we ask you a lot of questions in the first meeting, but you're not giving me any answers in the third meeting. Like it's just, you know, a red flag. So, 
You're not so, thinking. So in terms of the green light on that one, yeah. if someone, if you thought the business model was shaky or you just thought the, the team was too inexperienced and three months later they came back and say, hey, look, we're, we're growing, yeah. you'd be like, okay, my evaluation was wrong. The numbers are telling the truth. Yeah, exactly. I mean, to be honest, we don't expect the founders to know everything from the beginning, right? We don't expect them to be experienced. Um, and to be honest, like, I, I really don't look at the, like, the, the negative side of the, you know, everyone's flawed in some way, right? And actually, in every entrepreneur that I invest in is weird you're, in you're some You're perfect. You're yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, James. You're perfect, too. So some, are more, <laughs> some of us are more flawed than others. Yeah. It's no, no, but we, we don't really try to look at the focus on the flaws. We try to look for what, what, their, what their greatest strengths are, right? And, and hopefully one of them is actually, you know, bringing the company forward. And, and that's progress, basically, right? Okay. And so that's what's most important. Shinji, what about a red flag? Right, so I would characterize it as consistency, being consistent with what you're trying to solve, you know, and it's not just one action, right? It's about, you know, you, VCs last ask a lot of questions about why you founded the company, how you are trying to, you know, look for a, another CTO or co-founder and all that question. So it's all about consistency and, like, you know, if it's, if it's not consistent to what the vision is, I start asking questions. Those so, are the red flags. So, but so what would be an example of something that's that's not consistent with the vision? So, you know, obviously this, this, the entrepreneur is trying to raise money. And, like, I would always give advice of, like, a product market fit question or, you know, a hiring question, right? If the entrepreneur starts, like, resonating with me in terms of, like, Shinji, you say this. Okay, I will adapt. I mean, I'm not, I'm not running your company. You're running your own company, right? Okay. If I'm like guiding the company, I start feeling very weird, right? So that's that's inconsistency. You have to have your own vision and and your own problem solving statement, and you know just stick with it. Okay. So that's, that's my red flag and green green light. All right. Actually, that's um. You raise a really interesting point there. Actually, let me let's get James's get green, green light before. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna get back to you. Rose, real interesting one. <clears throat> my uh, my green is so you know disclaimer uh, we invest at the seed round so any traction that they have is probably s very small anyway uh, so what I like to look at is who has a CEO been able to hire um, <clears throat> really really awesome people they have lots of options and if you look you know who is able to you know who is willing to join this company that says a lot about the CEO right because okay. they they've interacted with the CEO more than I have right. So if the CEO is unable to recruit great people, that's like a significant, like a really, really bad um, uh, red flag. And the same thing on the green light side, if, it, if it's like, oh my God, like, you know, all these like former Google engineer, this guy exited a company, like it's like constantly impressing me. That is a really, really strong sign. So you could, it, it could be that you think the, the business is crazy and that, but you, you would take it as like, okay, if, if this group of people believe in it, they're seeing something I'm not seeing. <clears throat> well, well, that is obviously one point, but the other point is that uh, your original thesis is gonna like probably be wrong, and so uh. you're gonna have to like craft it, right? You're gonna have to think about the, you know, things that get thrown at you, and you're gonna have to adapt. So and a good team smart will be people, able to... Right, will be able to adapt, and that's the important part, right? Excellent. And you know, the CEO's ability to continue to hire great people is also important, because obviously there's turnover as well. Okay. Shinji, you mentioned one thing that I thought was fascinating and I want to drill down on. So you were saying that you admire people who um, have a backbone who will say, look, this is the right way to run a company and I appreciate your advice, but I'm not going to take it. Uh, I think in, in Japan traditionally, the relationship between venture capitalists and founders has been uh, very hierarchical. Uh, that founders often, in my opinion, listen to VCs far more than they should in terms of the specifics of how to run their business. And VCs also tend to not necessarily just give advice, but insist on their advice being followed far more than is healthy for either of them. And is this just my perception, or is this something that you think is pretty common in Japan? And in, if so, is it good, bad, and do we see it changing? I mean, that's a difficult question. I mean, so the VCs aren't technically a boss, right? We're just right. a shareholder. We own a stake of the company. 
And if we own a majority of the company, then we have legal rights, you know, as as a as a shareholder, right? But ultimately, we're not the boss, right? We're we're literally just putting in money and just trying to value add, right? So, uh, I think I mean, it's, I wouldn't say it's changing. It's already changed. It's a partnership model. Okay. Right. So I I've never felt that it's like you know the VCs bossing the company around, but. Like I come from an operational perspective uh, and experience, so if I see a startup that's not like you know executing to its max, then I would like be very very pressing, and try and get that company to execute as as you know as much as possible. So, uh, but you wouldn't want to weigh in on say marketing strategy. Yep. Yep. Definitely. Definitely yes. Definitely no. Definitely yes. Oh okay. <laughs> um, do you want to go? Uh, why don't you go ahead? <laughs> <laughs> um, or I can go. Yeah, well, actually, actually I'm, I'm, I, I think you, you might be a little bit right. I, I, I do see a little bit of hierarchy going on, um, but also I, I do see actually some VCs actually preferring entrepreneurs that kind of listen to them, um, which is not a great thing. Yes. Right. Exactly. It's, it's not Who a great thing. What are you talking thing. about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, no, because like, I, I actually, you know, I talked to a lot of VCs and I asked them, like, why did you pass on this company? Why did you pass on the entrepreneur, right? And actually you, you fairly hear that, like, they don't, Ganko de shita. Ganko, yeah, exactly. Ganko, and like basically, basically they don't—they're not listening to what they're th what they're advising on. Um, and and just to be clear, these are not are these their background is like in banking or they've got execution experience somehow. Ooh, interestingly, they probably don't have any executing experience. Um, <laughs> wow, a strong correlation. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, never listen to VCs because even on my best days, I'm right half of the time, right? So like. Um, <laughs> Uh, so never listen to VC. I think I think the the right kind of relationship is when it's mutual and like obviously they respect each other's decision. But then the VC shouldn't be feeling like they're running the company or the entrepreneur shouldn't be feeling like they're reporting to their boss, right? So so okay, here here's the thing. Uh, so 500, we invest in a lot of companies, and you know at least in 500 Japan, we have two people. It's really really hard to find bandwidth for every single company, right? Obviously, we love all our children equally, but some are going to get more attention than others, and uh, the interesting part is that the great companies don't really need any of our attention. Um, and uh, one thing that I've found is that it depends on the entrepreneur. Some entrepreneurs really want that sort of hands-on help. Uh, and then others don't. Like, fuck out of here. I know what I'm doing. That's great. And so, uh, you know, when I was an entrepreneur, I remember having to do, like, weekly meetings. And I was like, God, I'm spending all this time preparing for this weekly meeting. Weekly? Yeah. Now, I mean, I didn't wow. know any better. I was 22 wow. at the time. I was like, oh, this is VC. You know, no idea. Um, but you know, and th there's there's this spectrum. Some really want that hands-on, and some don't. Uh, you know, when you want that hands-on, you have to consider that it could go badly. Like for example, Sequoia, great brand name, awesome returns. They fire CEOs. The, are you comfortable with that risk? Obviously, they still get equity, and the CEOs still become rich. But I mean, you know, you might not have control at some point. Hmm. Okay. Um. Listen, I'm gonna, we're going to wrap up here, but we're going to open it up for a Q&A in just a moment. So uh, there's a microphone over there, uh, so you can, can line up. Uh, and I just, right now, I want to give a huge thanks to our panel. They did an amazing job. <laughs> and for our listeners at home, we're just about to start the Q&A, and I can't see, oh, we've got someone, so please ask away. Uh, hello, thank you for holding this session. Uh, my question is we have, uh, or theoretically, there's an amazing person that wants to join our team, senior level, Japanese, um, and they are for it, their wife, they're about to get married, their uh, fiance is happy for it to happen, but the fiance, the soon-to-be in-laws are against it. And, ah. uh, uh, and they are, uh, as we speak, going over to speak to their in-laws. And uh, <laughs> while, theoretically, uh, any advice that you would give uh, this I, person to have I have good... advice. James? Uh, have their VC uh, speak to these uh, uh, parents and uh, assure them that they have very reputable uh, companies backing the fund that's backing them, like you know, for example, uh, Mizuho Bank, uh, Mitsubishi oh, Estate. Throw uh, around some uh, big just, names. Just for example, right? Yeah. Like companies that they know, so that there's some credibility. It's not like this, like Yokohama Venture, right? 
Very good advice. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I've got to... I'll give you something from my own experience. Uh, when I went... Uh, I, I used to run software development at Zurich Financial here in Japan. And, uh, wonderful company, great job. I was bored out of my mind. Um, and it's a job that I, I really should have liked. I had no excuse for not liking it. I was just bored. And I quit that job to join a startup uh, doing a market entry into Japan. And my wife kind of got it. My in-laws didn't get it. Yep. And I, I think the key is the, the fiancé is really going to have to work on the in-laws. Mm. So somehow my wife convinced them that it was a good idea. I have no idea how she pulled that off. <laughs> <laughs> but I think James' advice is a good one. I mean, like, if she was convinced, if she was able to convince her parents to marry this guy, then, like... <laughs> <laughs> That's the risky part. <laughs> then she yeah. probably can convince her parents to, like, have him take you know, a more adventurous job, right? And so, I don't know, like, get, get the fiancé to get working. <laughs> <laughs> Good advice. But, but, you know, theoretically, if you're the CEO, you're the guy that has to be there, right? Don't, you know, get a VC start talking about your how good your company is, right? That's a little bit weak, right? So hey, you're listen, the CEO. You do what you got to do, man. Step you do up what to you the plate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck that. <laughs> all right, man. Thanks a lot. Good advice. Thank you all for the excellent advice. Yep. Yeah, please. Yo, hi. So hey, yeah. I, uh, I'd really like to ask the question that you don't want to ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what Q&A so, is for. So, Yay. so what kind of company do you want to invest in? Like, what are the qualities? Like, what great kind of company? companies. <laughs> okay. You want to invest in great De companies. Define, define great. Um, well, listen, VCs are not fortune tellers. We have no idea what's going to be hot. But uh, one thing, I mean, very, very high level framework is uh, why this, why now, and why you. Uh, so why this is, this is the problem, but why is this the appropriate solution? There's probably many solutions, but why is this the best one? Uh, another one would be why now? So okay, great, you found a solution, but why is no one else doing this? Um, and then the last one is, okay, great, the first two are checked off, but is this actually the team to execute? Why do you think you have a unique advantage over you know, someone else that might also come up with the idea or find out that you're actually doing pretty well, let's copy you. Okay, thanks. Um, I mean, I'm not gonna really answer your question, but like... <laughs> but you just wanna talk? I just wanna, no, one category I'm very, I'm, I'm, so I'm actually very bullish on, on a few categories, but I mean, if you think about it, like, uh, you know, in 40 years from now, 25% of ja Japanese population is gonna vanish, decline. Um, and, and so... Um, dark. <laughs> dark. <laughs> So the things I really want to invest in are like companies that basically make people more efficient, uh, make companies much more efficient, create like, like increase the population. Um, uh. that, that could be great too. <laughs> How or do you replace, do that? Replace like robotics. Um, but yeah, but anything like anything to get educated people or to or to get people educated in Japan from outside of Japan. So I invest in a couple of company or in a company that does that. Uh, but there's also you know one category I'm also looking at very heavily is called is the software as a service category basically for enterprise right and a little bit of a plug we're doing a conference and <laughs> <laughs> it's the software as a service conference in Tokyo on October 10th so search for my uh, Twitter handle DJ Tokyo yeah. and, and, and we're both investors I have smart lost HR. control Please of the use podcast smart HR. <laughs> <laughs> oh and we have a coupon code for disrupting Japan so <laughs> it's called disrupt all lowercase disrupt okay, okay. thank you okay. My short answer would be SaaS, right? Just like Hiro said, yeah. there's a lot okay. of like not productive, you know, process, you know, operations in Japan, and having switched from a typical Japanese traditional company to or Salesforce, I mean, it's totally different, right? So, and there aren't that much, you know, B2B startups to begin with. So you should go to the SaaS conference that he was doing. Okay, how much is it? Yeah, uh, if you use the disrupt coupon code, it's four thousand yen. It's a little bit expensive, but trust wow. me. Trust me, that's it's worth not expensive. It. That's not expensive. Okay. Yeah. Cheap. Trust okay. me. So it's good. Yeah. In in the sixties the advice was plastics. Now okay. it's SAS. Okay. Cool. Step right up. One, two, three. Oh, it's on. Okay. I have a question. Um, I hate to ask for a little bit unsourced claims, but I read from somewhere. Uh, that the portfolio of uh, Singapore VCs is bigger than portfolio of Japanese VCs. And you know, Japan is 100 
10 million people. Singapore is 8 million or something. Y- you're like talking about amount that, of capital invested. Or numbers of companies. Actually, is I wanted to ask, like, uh, is this true? And if <laughs> and why? And what is your view on this kind of thing? I don't thing? know your source, so I have no idea. Yeah, yeah, Wait, like, I, 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 I think there, but, uh, there's two different things we need to look at. There is the total amount of capital that Singapore-based VCs have. And for financial reasons, there's a lot of VCs who are based in Singapore who invest all over the world. I disagree with one important point here. Yeah. I don't believe Japan doesn't have money. Oh, no, no. No Japan's one said that they don't money. have money. It's just I where think they attitude, money. attitude to risk is the, the, something which bothers me. Yeah. But okay. there, there's lots of money. The trick is getting them to give it to you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <Woo! laughs> but it looks like I, I came here actually not to ask about my problem you know i i want like <coughs> well um singapore to, to be to be honest i actually don't know why singapore is more than japan but i, I have an idea or I have my own opinion of why uh japan is is significantly low um one i think it's just uh of course culture is a factor which everyone mentions but i think upside is a factor as well so in japan uh so in the u.s about 80 percent of the exits so we make money off of exits, not only just investors, but also entrepreneurs. So exit could be IPO or m and In the US, uh, 80% of the exits are through m and uh, whereas in Japan, 80% is through IPO. Um, and unfortunately, when the reason in Japan that they have to go to IPO at some point is because raising growth capital historically has been very, very difficult. And at some point, you kind of have to go uh, public to raise money, and that's how you get liquidity. But what happens is that you, know, you, you go public prematurely. Uh, and so th- the moment that you go public, you're looking at short term rather than long term. And so it stunts the growth of the company because, you know, the shareholders are thinking about, OK, next quarter are going to be profitable. Or so whatever. Japan could be much larger. Japan could be yeah. much larger. So so M&A, uh, there's not much M&A in Japan, which which is one issue uh, around uh, the that's impacting returns in general. Um, and then the other thing is that once you it's, it's kind of this strange like chasm between if you go public at between 100 million to 300 million, uh, or 500 million for that matter, I, actually I would even say 100. Mi- let's say 100 million to even like 900 million or a billion. Okay, it's very hard to raise money after that actually, and then once mm. you get over this billion part, it's easier to raise money. And so between 100 million and a billion, it's like this like ridiculous gap. Like how are you going to get there? You need to accelerate growth. You need to raise money, but you can't because you're already public, right? Um, but now there's there's signs of growth capital being available. Uh, so, you know, for example, Medicari is the example that we've been mentioning, uh, but there's also BizReach, there's also Soracom, there's also Smart News, and so we're seeing examples of companies being able to raise in the private markets, and so that's changing, but I think historically that's what's been stunting growth. It's the lack of growth capital and the lack of M&A. Shinji, you're our, our numbers guy. Does, okay. um, do those numbers stack up between Singapore and Japan? <laughs> Sorry, I don't know any numbers okay. for Singapore, so I'm, that's I'm going to... <laughs> Uh, I'm not actually a VC, so I'm free to talk off the top of my head here. But um, I, I think what you'll find is that there's a lot of VCs that are based in Singapore. And if you add those numbers up, they're investing all over the world. And that's a very large number. But the Singapore market is tiny. I think, it's, I think Nagoya has a larger GDP than Singapore does. And there's not a lot of Singapore companies that you, that you hear about. There's been a few acquisitions. So I think I don't have the numbers either. Um, but I, I think this, the value of Singapore startups is a tiny, tiny fraction of the value of Japanese ones. Right. But um, if your question is based on the fact that it's going to be difficult to raise money, as I said before, 2015 had you know, VC funds raising $2 billion of money. So there's money out there. Okay? And you should focus on SaaS. SaaS. <laughs> SaaS. That is the message we, we like today. SaaS. If you want money, SaaS. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Come on up. Don't be shy. Okay, I've got a, a little bit of a weird question. So my business partner and I are pitching an idea tomorrow to a quote-unquote salaryman VC. <laughs> and the way this situation works is if we pitch it and it's successful, they're going to immediately own that, you know, quite a, a big chunk of it. And we haven't exposed this to anyone else. So the question is, do we go with them or do we hold back and expose it to the rest of the market? That's one. Two, when's the best time to go to a VC? I guess it varies depending on the company and what you've got, but. I could have jumped in, but how big a chunk is a big chunk? It varies. It, it really depends. <laughs> well, well, obviously, no, in, in your case. I mean, in, in my case, it could be anywhere from 50%? 10 to 90%. 
Based on the that, investment. That's a hell of a range, you guys. It is. Wait, wait, wait. 10 to 90 percent? 10 to 90. So they, they left it intentionally vague. That's for people to come. Yeah. All right, it sounds like you should go to another VC. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> what was the second part of the question? When's the best time to go to a VC? It, it, you know, you have a complicated situation there, but you know, <laughs> if you're selling your company, you're, if you're selling 90% of your company, you should not do that, obviously. Yeah. Right? You're well, not I mean, it owning depends on how much you're selling it for. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Right? You're going to be the smallest shareholder in the company, but you're the founder, right? It does not make any sense, so you should talk to other people. And secondly, when's the best time to fundraise? You sh if, you're, if you think you have product market fit and you're, you're controlling your own destiny with cash flow, you have leverage. If your cash balance is like going down like this and you have like, I don't know, $1,000 left in your bank, you don't have an option. They can buy 90% of your company, right? So control your own destiny is, is my short answer. So I, I feel like there's a lot of missing information. Uh, so, so, so like, for, for example, like what are you doing? Is it a very capital intensive business? It will be, yes. It will be, okay. Um, so that's, that's one thing to consider. And how much are you looking to raise? 10 million. 10. Okay. Ten. Well, okay, that changes the problem quite a bit. Yeah. It's very hard to raise 10 million with actually no product, I'm assuming. Pure concept at this point. Right. Wow. So that changes it a lot. Um, selling 90%, maybe that's a little bit too much, but maybe not completely out of the question. Maybe between 60 and 80 is maybe not unreasonable considering the fact that you're basically, they're just betting on you, right? Exactly. So what, do you, what can you offer to the VCs? Like you have some sort of technical background? Yeah, IP. We have, IP. we have IP and we have a strong technical background, my team and I. Okay, and it's not, it's not replicable? Um, Depending what how smart you are, you can replicate anything, right? That's a bit of a strange question. Why don't you just join that company? It's not a strange yeah, question. Yeah, it sounds like <laughs> an acquisition. I mean, I'm asking whether it's defensible, right? Like how much do they need you? I mean, it's, that's, all these that's negotiations the are, you know, it's a power balance. Like it's a, you know, who has the, the upper hand? Right, as as Shinji was saying, if you have a lot of cash in your bank account, then you're fine. Like you, you don't, you're not really stressed to raise money, mm. right? And so you end up with better terms, obviously. So anyway, in your particular situation, situation raising ten million with nothing, I actually think that maybe you, can si you should consider <laughs> it if they're willing to do it. Yeah. So well, it changes the dynamics quite a bit. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in on when to talk to a VC, or better, how to talk to a VC, and and you three can tell me whether it makes sense or whether I'm totally full of it. But I, I think when you're, when you're raising money, VCs, like you're saying, they're, they're, they're herd animals. And the first question out of almost every VC's mouth is, who else is investing? Mm. Um, so if you want to raise money, you've got to have a defined start date and a defined end date. And if you're going to start fundraising on June 1st, you can talk to people beforehand and say, you know, um, I, I'm haven't quite decided, we're not ready to talk valuation, you let people know, but you're not gonna sign in, and then when it's time to go, it's like, go, this is gonna be six weeks, you're either in, you're out, and make everyone move along that same time. And the biggest job you have raising money is hurting your VCs like cats to, to all execute at the same time. So I'd say just make it a really structured thing, and. I mean, Does uh, that make sense, yeah, guys? Or? Good. Uh, actually, well, for early stage investors like us, it's a little different. Actually, the earliest you can get their attention is probably the right. Uh, what, what I would say because so I mean, so the earliest you can get their attention, you should meet the VCs or the investors and you know try to talk uh, talk through the idea, get them to know you, and those kind of things. And hopefully, though, you'll have a second and third meeting with that investor, right? Um, but if you can't get their attention the first try, then Make some progress, make some difference, you know, uh, uh, develop your product, whatever it is, and try to get their attention again. Show and, them what they're missing. Yeah, show them what they're missing. And if you still can't get their attention, then do more progress, right? And then, like, and then if they still don't return like your, your emails, then they're probably missing out on something that's very big or, um, yeah, they just really don't care what you're doing. Or you should, uh, be, you should be talking to other VCs. Yeah, we're we're talking talking about that other point. VCs, By the way, can you get traction first? Like, you know, is there anything you can do without this $10 million in initially? Like, yeah, of course. I mean, we've got money. We can prototype stuff. But okay. It's really well, I mean, you know, the more progress you make, the, you know, the more likely you are to get better terms, right? Mm. So you might want to maybe raise like a seed round from investors that will signal to other more like herd investors that this is a good company. All right, good. Um, and that might be the way to go. I'll see you afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good Thank luck you. with it. Thanks. Come on up.
Hi guys, thanks for your questions or answers so far. Uh, I have a pretty term of a wide question. And I, I, I kind of want to know, I like to think about ideas, you know, holes to fill in society, whatever, things to improve upon, but I'm not sure how to go from point A to point B. Like, how do I go from idea to startup? Wow, okay, that's a pretty broad it, one. It's, it's my No, question. that's a great question. It really is. It's just, I want to see who's going to distill a great answer for this one. I understand it's a pretty difficult question, but any any advice or... Anything is appreciated. Well, I mean, uh, if you have I any idea at all that you think is quite interesting, or like whenever you go to the shower or do whatever you think the, you're, you, you see, you you, hear, you you realize that your brain is gravitating towards that idea. That's probably an idea you want to try to execute upon. Um, and the way to execute it is talk to customers, right? Yeah. Like talk to potential users, talk to customers, and see if it's even a valid idea, right? And then, and then from there you'll realize, oh shit, you know, like this thing is going to be really big, or it's like, oh, never mind, like people are repelling against my idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, like, yeah, basically, like, uh, yeah, I always get this like question, basically, like everyone has uh, tons of ideas, hundreds of ideas, they don't know which one to execute on. There's always one or two ideas that your just your mind tor just tends to gravitate towards. Kind of distillate. Yeah, yeah, right, and that's that's the one you want to try to execute on. Which I think uh, what Hero's getting at, and what I've always said, is just try to sell it. Try to get someone to pay real money for it. And if you can make that sale, if you can get people, because when people start talking about money, uh, if you say, what do you think of this idea, people don't want to hurt your feelings, and they'll say, it's a great idea, you should you should totally do that. Yeah. Uh, don't, don't ask your mom. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, no. <laughs> Um, but if you say, you know, you know, would you pay $20 for this, that'll cut it in half. And if you say, well, will you pay $20 for that, then you know if you've really got something. Now, yeah. you can't always do that, but if you can, that is the quickest way to know if you've got, got something real, I think. Something with potential. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, obviously the, you know, the short answer is that it's always easy to build a product. Even if it's not a real product, you can use prototyping tools out there. And even if you're talking to customers and you're talking about your idea that it's going to solve something, it has to be a product, right? You can say that it's going to, you know, serve, you know, solve the search problem, but what the hell does that mean, right? You have to show it to, f you know, for the customer to believe it. So, so when you mean a product, yeah. do you mean something that's that's the exact same thing? You're s what do you mean exactly by product? I mean, th if the idea is just in phrases, everybody's just going to say that sounds cool come back with a product. <laughs> so yeah, not just a in short, just yeah. just write a sketch. There's prototype, you know, as, as I just mentioned previously, there's tools out there that you can just, you know, build something out there. So, so right. something to show people. Something to show people, right? Okay, excellent. Excellent. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. So we got time for just one more question. Come on up. I guess I'm lucky. Hi, guys, thank you for the session. So I have actually two questions. Uh, first one is, at the beginning for a startup, where do you think it's easier to raise money, in Japan or Southeast Asia? Actually, specifically, I'm thinking about Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And the other question, if I decide to start off in Japan, do I look more credible to VCs in Japan if I have a Japanese co-founder? Ooh, good question. Good question. It's good I like question. the second one. The first one, I actually don't know. But uh, probably if you're a foreigner in Japan, it's easier to raise in Southeast Asia. That's just my honest opinion. I'm a foreigner that's raised money in Japan, so I kind of know. Um, I think it's an uphill battle. Why, um, why, why is that? Is it because of the language barrier? There's, or? There's, well, I mean, I speak fluent Japanese, so it's not the language barrier, but there's sort of an unconscious, unconscious bias. Um, and it sounds, like you're, it, it sounds like you're a solo uh, founder, right? Yeah. So, <coughs> so that's one. Uh, the other one, to answer your s the second part of your question, oh. I think you should absolutely oh. have a Japanese uh, co-founder with you. Um, right. But it's not necessarily a bad thing to be a foreigner, right? There's the great thing about being a foreigner uh, in Japan, and can you speak Japanese? Yes, I can. Okay, so that's a really important point as well, is that uh, you can, like, you can, uh, you, you get to benefit from all the societal, uh, like, cultural nuances that are beneficial to you, like everyone's very polite to you, great service, all this stuff, but you don't necessarily sense. have to adhere to them. Like you can go straight to the CEO and uh, you know, ask for things. But you know, um, I'm, a, I'm a woman, so it's a little bit different I think in, in society in Japan when you know, I'm a foreigner and I'm a girl. <laughs> you, sounds like an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, I wish it, I would say use it to your advantage. I mean, yeah. you know, there are times when I wish I also was a girl and I had boobs right. that I could. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want but, that taken out of context. <laughs> Well, it, it really depends on which country your your target market is, right? If your yeah. target market is Kuala Lumpur, then you should raise money in Kuala Lumpur. Right. If your target market is Japan, exactly. go That's for Japan, uh, because you know VCs can would basically invest in ideas or people or yeah, basic companies that they highly resonate with the idea with, right? And so, um, most likely the chances are higher if they're in the country that you're trying to target. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, foreigner. So, <laughs> foreigner. Um, if you can basically give a compelling reason why you, right? I mean, like you know, James said that it has to be why you need to be able to answer why you and why now, right? And if right. you're able to say because I have, you know, if you're able to basically give a compelling reason for that, then it really doesn't matter if you're a foreigner or a woman. Um, yeah, just give a compelling reason for why why they have to invest in you, and you're the only one that can uh, you know address this idea and this opportunity. Well, you know, of course I'm gonna try, but it's yeah. just like I want to be prepared. You know what what they kind of expect of me. It'll be really scary if you're just trying to raise money and have a co-founder that's Japanese. You know, that's that's a nightmare. You know, I mean, you know, just imagine Wait, yourself. Wait, what? Why? I mean, no, 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 <laughs> no. If you're just trying to act. And you're trying to just fundraise. It's it's, it's a nightmare. So oh, so it's got to be a for uh, real. Yeah, pick, pick it's for real. Really, right? yeah, yeah, really like not a fake one. Yeah. Let's yeah. say your your market is Malaysia, and you raise money from a Japanese VC. They'll obviously be telling you about the Japanese market, right? <laughs> so imagine that for each board meeting, you're gonna have you know you know a handful of you know nightmares every single night. So just raise at your market, right? Okay. And look for founders in the market. Well, let, let me add a bit. One from my own experience and one from the experience of so many people who've come on this show. So I've raised money as a foreigner in Japan for a number of startups. Um, I can't say it was easy, but I don't think it's necessarily easy no matter where you are. And I can't say whether it's harder being a foreigner because I've never raised money as a Japanese person in Japan. But it's possible. And I think that if you've got a strong idea and some traction and a good team, you're gonna be basically on the same footing. I, I, I think the other factors are gonna be so much more important than your nationality. And the other thing is sort of like James was hinting at, or James was saying, is that there's no inherent advantages or disadvantages, all right? It's, there's differences, and you use them to your advantages. Um, and there's been an awful lot of women entrepreneurs who have come on the show in the last two years. And every single one of them has said that they don't really think about the fact that they're a female founder or whether it's an advantage or a disadvantage. It's just one of a thousand different situations that they're in. And you try to do the best with what you've had. You try to take your uniqueness and turn it into an advantage. So on one hand, the differences that make it might make it harder to raise from a VC will make it so much easier to get press attention. Um, really good point. So th there's, I, I'm a firm believer there's, there's no inherent advantages or disadvantages, only differences you can capitalize on. Just play to your strengths, don't worry about it. Yep. And fill in the pieces that you feel like are missing. Right. Excellent, that's a great okay. question though. Thank you guys. <laughs> okay guys, I wanna thank our, our panel one more time. And I want to thank all of you for coming out here in the rain <laughs> and supporting us. And most of all, thanks for listening. And I'm Tim Romero, and thanks for listening to Disrupting Japan. Thanks a lot, guys. We'll see you next year.